Um, but yeah, so on behalf of the Diggers Forum, we undertook a survey, uh, ran through October, um, to get field archaeologists' perspective of consortiums. And it's important that I tell you that it is the Diggers Forum, it is not in any way Molas or anybody else's, and it's not reflective of them. It was, um, it was completely anonymous. I didn't ask who the people were, I didn't ask what projects they were on, I didn't ask um, what companies they worked for, none of that. So apart from a few answers where they have told me, um, I don't know any of that. Um, because I thought that was important. Um, because I don't, yeah, I don't want to be a slangy match about who one company is better than the other or not. Um, but essentially, yes, consortiums are an excellent idea in theory because they bring together the expertise, they bring together the manpower, they bring yeah, and they are an excellent way of sharing resources, staffing the projects, and all these exciting buzzwords. Um, but at no point do I feel that the actual diggers, so the archaeologists, the supervisors, even the POs, are asked for their feedback on how they thought these projects went. Now I've sat in, for the past couple of years, um, a couple of CIF conferences, and being told about these things from various people and how awesome the projects are, and no one's debating the, the important archaeology that's come out of these massive joint venture infrastructure works. Um, but I do think we do need to look on how we are treating our staff and how they are feeling about working on them. So I asked some questions. Um, so as with all surveys, um, there was not a huge response. But, <laughs> but I think, yeah, but I did get 66, which I'm going to take as a win, because I know that is in no way representative of everybody. Um, at least it's the chatty ones. And as with, <laughs> and as with all responses, um, some of them aren't helpful. But some of them are actually quite good. <laughs> so, so yeah, so I will, I will kind of run through these as best I can, in that I've not had a massive amount of time to digest these, because I got these beginning of the month, I think. Um, so, so I have not had time to really go into anything, um, but I'm just going to pull up some of the salient points that I kind of thought were notable. So one of the first questions, um, as with everything that's kind of based around it, was about paying, was about paying conditions and how these were comparative um, between the different archaeological companies that were working within these consortiums. Uh, not because I believe in any sense of the evangelization or can we can enforce that all companies pay the same. That would be mental. Um, although it would be nice if they were at least um, comparable. So that was one of the first questions. And some of the answers um, that came back were that they didn't know, which is totally understandable, because although I'm quite chatty and I will, you know, only get a good moan, if you're sat in the pub and you get the good moans about the different uh, terms and conditions, it's not really absolutely accurate. But some people, some com companies were working different hours, which seems an odd thing to be doing on a joint venture or a consortium work. Um, there was different pay. Um, between the companies at the same level, different toil, different overtime arrangements, different, um, but on the other hand, some companies or some joint ventures were addressing these differences and kind of trying to sort them all out. Um, obviously, the biggest thing being the different, different companies had the different rates for doing the same job, which obviously isn't great. Um, most concerningly, I had a supervisor from one company and their wage was actually significantly lower, even though they were supervising down the diggers on that project which is not great. Um, but yes, but the same as, yes, and one of the other ones I'd like to be like, the answer is technically yes, but it took a while for the companies to bring things in line. For example, they all got extensions to their contracts, so these specific <coughs> contracts, but one company took much longer to update their holiday policies in relation to these extensions than the other company did. And um, that kind of equaled out into what days that people felt they could or could not take. And if you're on quite a short-term contract, that is, an interesting difference to kind of coming to overcome. Um, so that was between the different companies, and then I wanted to know if they had comparable contracts. So if you had a project-specific contract, how that kind of compared with people that were on the core company contracts. And the majority of those, um, depending on who you listen to, the, yeah, they were definitely different. Um, but some said they were higher, and some said there were lower rates of pay. So I'm not quite sure how that balances out and obviously which companies they were for. Um, but the biggest issue seems to be around um, sick pay and when people qualify for sick pay. And then obviously, again, if they, if, they have to, yeah, if they have to do the six month sort of probationary period before you qualify for sick pay and your contract is not six months long, then how do you ever qualify for sick pay? Um, and therefore, 
they were coming into work sick to the point where there was a yeah there were bombs and bugs <coughs> going around because they couldn't afford to not come into work, which is not great. Um, again, it's different contracts. Again, yeah, some yeah uh, the system was completely different and therefore they're not really comparable, which is fair. Um, some of the core companies were paid less than those in the temporary contracts or the project specific contracts, so to attract those people in, which. Again, you can understand the need to have got the rates of pay up for specific projects if you're trying to attract a large number of individuals, but if you're then supplying core contract people to that project, it's not, it's not great for morale if you're on different rates of pay for essentially the same work. Um, yeah, that was fun. And then, uh, and then I also wanted to ask, yeah, if people qualified for the same benefits, because you'd have thought because a consortium is not a legal entity, I mean, joint venture, but a consortium is not, so people employed on project specific contracts will be employed by one company or the other that's within there. So you would have thought that contracts from the same company should be comparable. And again, that's not necessarily the case. So the people on the, on the core contracts were getting benefits or access to benefits that weren't actually accessible to everybody. Um, usually there is pension now, which is quite good from what I can see, yeah, from the results I've got, so they were admitted pension. Um, but yeah, but it's not, it's a bit sort of still open to, oh, maybe. <laughs> so there were obviously differences within company, which it doesn't, yeah, within, within the company, with people on the same, yeah, working for the same company with different access to, to benefits as well. Then I kind of moved on. So to the recording, the recording methodologies that are on, um, on site. No, well, the also, well, their words. <laughs> So the excavation methodologies of what was going on, obviously that's a big part of, the, of any project, is like what are you doing and how are you doing it is a big part of it. And although quite a large percentage of people did say, yes, I was told quite clearly what those were, concerningly, 21% apparently weren't. What happened there? Like why, why are there people on site that don't know what they're doing and how they're doing it? So that's, that is an issue. What is it? other exciting things like that and then yes question they kind of ran into um yeah yeah and once once on these sites um and you are doing the recording are you familiar with what it is that you are recording are you re familiar with the recording methodologies that are being undertaken you can't just throw a whole load of people from different companies onto a site and just expect them to know what they're doing with recording like although lots of companies do use like the modas guide and they're all loosely based on a similar system you can probably figure it out in, the, in lots of cases but clearly some people weren't familiar with it and not only were they not familiar yeah it was a completely different system so they had to kind of had to make it up as they went along which was concerningly an answer um yeah that they devised their own which is always fun uh compost x to try and work out what they were doing <laughs> Which kind of these are knock-on effects of what, what we were up to, um, but yeah, some of the methodologies seemed to iron out as they went along. So although they were teething projects, as with a lot of big projects, I think they, they did <coughs> iron out as they went along. Somebody had undertaken two different projects. On the one, the introduction process was very clear. On the other, however, there was confusion over the methodologies. They also um, told that the strategy was on each site they worked on for this other consortium or this other this other project. But even with on a similar project, the methodologies that were given weren't the same from one to the other. So even also on such a big project, there was no consistency between the sites within that project as to how they were doing things. Um, yeah, if it's, it appears that some projects were being run depending on who was lead in that area. So depending on which site you were on within the specific project would depend on how you were recording things and what the methodologies were. But, yeah. That's interesting. Obviously, if there's a completely new recording system for everybody, you have to give time for people to get up to speed with that. You can't just introduce new recording methodologies and just hope for the best. Well, you can, but... <laughs> what do we think now? So that was fun. Um, with training and development, kind of what you're going to drop to one place. So essentially, our, one of the big selling points I would have thought about this consortium working is that the different companies involved have different skills, different skill sets, they're different backgrounds, different specific knowledge that you can kind of tap into and train all of your staff. It's the whole point of collaboration. You would have thought you'd be able to pick up these differences. 
So a big part of that would be, yeah, are there CPD opportunities within that? Um, and are they the same? So, the, yeah, so in question eight, did you receive the same level of CPD opportunities? Yes or no? Cool, 50-50. So I'm not sure whether that relates, yeah, sort of, again, that's on perspective. I mean, my perspective is always as a core member of staff and actually just being quite bullshit about stuff, I generally try and, yeah, I put my name in the hat for any CPD opportunities. So I would say on ones that I've been on, yes, there was loads. I took advantage of it all, but I'm quite like that. They're not necessarily offered. They're not necessarily easy to find. They're not necessarily clear and consistent um, across the board. That is. And also, yeah, did you have the opportunity to learn a new skill during the project? Which is clearly a big thing. So lots of no's, lots of no's. And I think that's a little bit upsetting if that's one of the main selling points of why we're doing consortium work, why we're working together. If these, yeah, because I think it should be like kind of otherwise. There's no point working outside of your comfort zone if you're just going to try and stick with what you already know. You can't. It doesn't. It doesn't fit. You know, we do need to be evaluating how we're doing things and why we're doing things, why we're doing them, and having those debates and allowing yourself to kind of be a little bit open-minded about what you're doing. Um, quite nicely though, there was, yeah, the one, of the, one of the replies was there was a difference in the training allowance and the opportunities provided, but the supervisors did go out of their way to try and sort it, which is nice. And um, yeah, depending on what the training was available at the time, they tried to share these across the companies. So that was good. A lot of them, Kind of, yeah, any training that was provided, I think, does center around people that were promoted and were therefore given the access to the triple STS training, to first aid training, and things like that. But I presume from experience I might be wrong, but actually that was a requirement of the project as opposed to training that would have been given them anyway. So that's what it is. Um, but again, this is not, yes, yeah, so I was looking, so this is not necessarily something that's just an issue with consortium work on joint ventures. This is this is kind of a wider, a wider issue that I think does need does need addressing. Quite a lot of people um, came to came back that actually yeah the, the training they did get outside of the supervisory training that they required really to do their job. Um, a lot of people did get access to um, survey training of some of some form, which I think is a move into sort of, sort of innovation sort of ways maybe because we have been more innovative about the way we're recording things, hopefully, fingers crossed, or just because the nature of the job is just so massive that everyone needs to have a go at it. Mm, I don't know. I don't quite know. I will look at these. So, do our, opinion, do our opinions count? Um, arguably, just looking at question 12, were you asked to give feedback? No. It's an overwhelming no. Um, which I think is sad, and it's not just, a, just, just a, and again, it's, it's not just stuck on the big projects on, on consortiums and joint ventures. I think this is a this is a wider issue within within the industry that we don't do this for big projects, for small projects, for any projects. When when how often have you been asked? How often, yeah, for feedback, it's quite rare. <laughs> it's very special when it happens, um, and when you are asked, which is more more importantly, I think. They're not actually giving it back anyway. So <laughs> if you are given the opportunity to say what, give your opinion, I think we need to be picking that up and running with it. Because, um, because if you are given the opportunity, it so rarely happens that if you're gonna, yeah, like wasting it, it should just, oh, sacrifice, no. Um, <laughs> yeah, and I think the problem, the problem is why people don't give it back is because you felt even when you are asked, you're not heard, or you're not listened to, or you're dismissed. Because it's all well and good, being asked our opinions and kind of passing it all up. If nothing comes back down, if you're, it doesn't matter because it's just asking you for asking your sake. It's essentially being terribly British. Oh, how are you? You don't care. I don't care. Mm. So you're fine. Just so you're fine. <laughs> Nobody cares what you think. So I think that's the other problem. Why would I give my opinion? Why would I raise any issues if nothing's going to change? If we're not going to be listened to, if you're not going to come back to me and say, this was an excellent idea, but you're clearly mad. So we're not going to do it. Or this was a good idea, but we can't do it for these reasons. Like we're not, we're not stupid people. We are ridiculously educated. We have a lot of skills. We have a lot of, you know, experience and qualifications and just, just ridiculously niche 
geeky, nerdy knowledge. And nobody wants it, you can't give it away. <laughs> Apart from the public, they love it. Um, but because of this, we do have mental ideas, and we are quite set in our ways. I'm the first to put my hand up about that. But I am happy to try things. Um, but what I don't like is innovation for innovation's sake. Like, oh, we should do it this way because it's shiny and new. Like, like I'll give it a whirl, but when I tell you it doesn't work, I'd like you to listen to me while you just plow on and say, no, no, it's happening now. <coughs> and then some other people's thoughts about how did people think the companies work together was quite interesting, to be honest. Um, and I'm going to read out some of the least ranty, um, <laughs> which, is, which is interesting. Um, but yeah, so stressful incidents usually evolved seem, um, that evolved seem from lack of cohesive recording strategies beforehand, where site X was using company Y's methods and site Z was using company A's methods. So it's just, I think it comes back to communication again. Um, yeah, they improved a lot, but there were communication problems. Uh, generally, yes, but they can be improved. No pointers, no pointers on how to improve things. Um, uh, so yeah, yeah, so the project, the excavation side of it was a success, but only because of the supervisory team and the large amount of support that was provided on site. It remains to be seen if it went well with regards to the recording standards and post -ex. I think that's quite telling as well, that a lot of these answers, because, because they're from the diggers, we don't, we don't know as a whole normally how what we do affects later on. And I think that's another failing. It's all one and good saying, well, your opinion doesn't matter because you know what you're doing. I'm like, well, if you're not telling me that, I don't know what I'm doing. How am I supposed to be any better? Um, yeah, and otherwise, yeah, it went all right. There's a few teething problems, but yeah, from the top to bottom, it was all top to yeah, communication. So I think the final bit was kind of my event, yeah. But yeah, these differences between the companies, they do not lead to nice, cohesive working things. They, they affect they affect physical and mental health on the sites. Job, yeah, different companies have different job roles and different job titles. And if you don't know where you sit within the structure of the site, how is that helpful for anybody? But also, some things might be expected of you that you don't really see coming or didn't realise was your job because it wasn't told to you. We need to be standardising everything and we need to be doing this early, early on. There's no good sort of getting a year into a massive project and going, oh, we should maybe tell them about sampling. Um, but yeah, and the whole point of this year is about the infrastructure, about this training development. And I think we need to be investing more in training and we need to be investing more in the people that can do that training. Because if we lose those, ex those experienced members of staff, how are we going to do it? And then, yeah, how, how are we being perceived? Uh, uh, not just within ourselves and talking to, you know, talking to ourselves, but within, within construction and higher up the food, food chain. Um, yeah, and I think one of the kind of comments that did come back is that many of the problems encountered are as a result of the top-down requirements imposed by the infrastructure project as a whole, not the consortium or the individual archaeological companies. And that kind of needs to be addressed as well. And that is all. Brilliant. Thank you.